In this episode, I talk to filmmaker Lucy DeCruz about her film My Body, Their Choice, about the abortion debate in Argentina. We discuss Argentina's La Loca del Bebito, or Crazy Baby Lady, and ways we can try to have better dialogue and understanding about abortion, the sacredness of life, and women's health. Welcome to the podcast where we talk about things we're not supposed to, learn how to have difficult conversations, and talk to people about what makes them different. This is the We Don't Talk About That with Lucas Land podcast where we do talk about that with me, Lucas Land. It's never the right place or time. It's imperceptible to the eye. My guest today is Lucy DeCruz. Uh, She's a filmmaker, has been working on a film uh, documentary about abortion in Argentina, and I'm excited to talk to her about uh, a controversial topic, one that we sometimes avoid talking about, uh, and that fits very well with uh, the theme of of this podcast. So, Lucy, welcome to We Don't Talk About That. (laughs) Thank you very much. Tell us a little bit uh, about yourself first, you know, where you're from, who you are and, and kind of what you do. Yeah, so I'm from the UK, um, I, but I moved to Argentina in 2014, spent about a year there. Then I left for two years and ended up moving back for another two years um, and just left recently a few months ago. Um, so I've always worked in film and TV. And when I moved back two years ago to Argentina, it just was something that really sort of struck a chord with me that was something that needed to be documented. It was sort of leading up to the Senate vote a year ago that I decided that I to make this film, basically. Yeah. Tell, tell me a little bit, maybe first, about what, um, for you, uh, why is abortion an issue that you're passionate about, maybe more than, than other things? What is it? What's kind of behind that story for you? Um, I think I'm a bit of a feminist, really. Mm-hmm. And just sort of seeing how, from having lived in Argentina and seeing... The, the sort of struggle that women have there it is a very male dominated society mm-hmm. um, and following on from the Ni Una Menos campaign which was against domestic violence it was just another struggle that women face in that country um, I think there's a lot of different things that need to be addressed and it's just was just another topic that came up and it's just something that I feel very strongly about that women should have the choice to decide what to do with their own bodies so from having lived there and witnessed the situation firsthand, leading up this vote, it just felt really important to document this and to to sort of try and make a change. Yeah. Well, tell me, tell tell us a little bit about the situation in Argentina. I think uh, people probably aren't as aware. Um, I I live in currently live in Bolivia, and the situation in Bolivia is not exactly the same. But I imagine uh, many countries throughout Latin America, there there tends to be a culture of of protest and a lot of conflict. And, um, it's something that people aren't as, and also, um, as you said, there's a lot of machismo. There's a lot of, um, very, uh, male centric, uh, still culture, a lot of sexual violence uh, is very high. And also Catholicism is a very, still a very, very large influence throughout Latin America. But what, tell specifically about Argentina, what was happening? You know, you mentioned the, the legislature, there was a vote coming up. Um, what are some of the elements uh, that were at play um, in Argentina? Yeah, so I think, as you said, it it is, um, I think a lot of it is linked to it being a very religious country, similar to Ireland in that way, that it is a very Catholic country that's kind of, you know, very traditional. um, You know, there's a lot of beliefs and values that Catholics have against um, against abortion and against sort of sex before marriage, against um, sex education in schools and that kind of thing. So I think that does play a big part in it. And leading up to the vote, you know, there were so many people out on the streets, you know, protesting and fighting for a change um but it was just a very sad end uh, to to see that senate didn't you know didn't vote for a change so it did end up with a 38 to 31 vote to keep it illegal mm-hmm. it's highly illegal in in argentina um even in some cases of of rape and um and violence that that women still are unable to get abortions there was a case with um a young woman i think she was about 24 
years old in the north a few years ago in the north of Argentina and she was diagnosed with cancer and she wasn't allowed to then have her treatment because they found out she was pregnant and she wasn't allowed to get an abortion either so she died and of course um, the baby died as well so it's cases like that that it's just kind of ridiculous um, that in this day and age you know even aside from that at the end of the day you know there's so many different different reasons why a woman might not want to have an abortion. It might be that they can't afford to have a baby at that time. It might be that they don't feel able to have a baby. They might not want a baby. It's, there's so many different reasons. It might be a case that they're too young or that it's, you know, it's been an accident or, um, you know, there's so many different reasons. And I don't think abortion is something that's taken lightly. And I think that's sort mm-hmm. of a, um, a misconceived idea from, from the other side, from the anti-choice side that mm-hmm. people are just, you know, going off for abortions willy nilly. And that's obviously not the case. It's always a tough decision. But I think it should be a decision that could be can be made by the individual and that should be able to happen mm-hmm. under safe and legal cir- circumstances with our with proper aftercare. And that's just not the case at the moment. So it's um yeah, it was it was amazing, actually, the day of the vote to see how many women were out on the streets fighting for change Mm -hmm. and hopefully there will be another vote we just really hope to get our film out to put pressure on for a change before that vote happens yeah well as you mentioned a lot of times in this debate about abortion the the people in the middle who are making decisions about what to do about their pregnancy are often sort of almost left out of the conversation it feels like in in some ways the Mm -hmm. realities of of what people are going through um, in your in your film that you've made and in your experience in in Argentina, what what is it that women uh, deal with as they have to wrestle with these questions about what their options are for pregnancies that are uh, unwanted or or even if they're just trying to make a decision about it? What what did you see and and tell us a little bit about the situation? Yeah, so we spoke to a lot of different women who had gone through. Um, abortions in Argentina, obviously uh, illegal abortions, and there is just, there is just nowhere to turn. I mean, we spoke to one uh, Irish immigrant who had um, undergone a horrific abortion there a couple of years ago before the law change in Ireland, mm-hmm. and she said it was like she just had a ticking di- time bomb inside her. She didn't mm-hmm. know where to turn, what to do. She looked online for resources. She asked friends, and she was just completely stuck. And she she actually ended up um, by accident in in well you know, unknowingly in a fake abortion clinic that was run by Catholics who were actually just trying to convince her not to have an abortion, um, which I can imagine must have been highly, um, highly intimidating. We actually went and did some secret undercover filming at one of these clinics. um, And she ended up eventually managing to get an illegal abortion by somebody where she literally just went to an apartment. It was a rundown apartment Hmm. up for sale um, she went into a room, paid a thousand dollars in cash, was knocked out unconscious, um, woke up, you know, covered in blood, vomiting, didn't know what was going on and was sent straight out. And that was it. And she, you know, it's, it just sounded absolutely horrific. You know, there's a lot more details that um, we've put into the film that she she actually talks about this experience. But it was just awful to listen to. Um, no aftercare whatsoever. And, mm-hmm. you know, as she said, there's lots of women die on these tables because there's no other choice. We've got, there's, you know, we spoke to a doctor and she told us that women and girls are going to awful um, extremes trying to do home abortions where they're using anything from knitting needles to coat hangers to stalks of parsley to try and create mm-hmm. an infection in the uterus, anything to try and, to try and, you know, escape um the pregnancy because there's no other choice so i think the you know the biggest point to make is that these illegal abortions will continue to happen regardless um what a law change will do is just allow that environment for a safe and legal option with aftercare Mm -hmm. well to give you an idea of where sort of where i come am coming from i am a christian but i'm Mm -hmm. usually pretty dissatisfied with the choices in debates like this that were given as if as if uh, one side doesn't value life and and the other side does, or it seems to be we, we sort of make uh, caricatures of both sides. I I like the idea of a consistent ethic of life as as far as for for the Christians, right? So I wouldn't would not agree with the death penalty either because I don't think we should be taking any lives. But I think also what happens is the the debate. This this t- 
topic, this question in particular, becomes so heated and, and is so controversial that actual measures to reduce abortions are not shared. They should be, they really should be shared by both sides. Um, there's a lot of common ground actually between the two sides when it comes to how would you how would you actually make it safe, accessible, and in the process reduce the number of abortions overall. Um, but uh-huh. it seems like something gets in the way. Uh, it, it becomes politicized for for different reasons. In your film, you follow uh, this woman who has been dubbed, I'm guessing by her opposition, as the the crazy baby lady. Could you tell us a bit about uh, this lady and and how you kind of connected with her and following her around? Yeah, so we'd seen uh, her in the media. Um, She is sort of a very extreme, extremist campaigner on the other side. Um, uh, I know they call themselves pro-life. I prefer to call call them Mm -hmm. anti-choice. But she basically goes around with plastic fetuses and tries to convince people not to have abortions and so we we got in touch with her to sort of we thought it's very important to look at both sides in the film mm-hmm. and to try and understand the other sides the other side's point of view and to try and bridge the the gap in and the divide in the country so we did follow yeah. her around and discuss things with her and sort of challenge her views and mm-hmm. listen to her views and you know what we did find actually in the end was that she is actually a very likable character you know she invited us into her home and she mm-hmm. um talked about what she's doing but I, you know, myself and Andrew could not agree with with her views because at the end of the day, we do believe that women should have the choice and it should be down to the decision of the individual because all circumstances are different um, and there's lots of different reasons for it. Um, but she did tell us that, you know, for example, I think she, her daughter is 12 or 13 years old, that if her daughter was raped, that she would be keeping the baby and that that would be that. Yeah. Um, which which I really just find so extreme because mm-hmm. it's, you know, if a young girl has been raped, that's that's a reminder for the rest of her life. And to suddenly have a, a child mm-hmm. to bring up as well. I just, you know, for me, I, I just I just don't think that's right. Yeah. Was there was there anything about her about being with her? Like you said, she she was a likable person. Anything that struck you that maybe you hadn't thought about from the other side before that you uh, maybe understood better, not necessarily changing your view or position, but maybe having a little bit of a better insight into where the other side was coming from? Yeah, slightly. I did, you know, I could just sort of empathize with with her reasoning and her views on the situation. But I think there needs to be a bigger picture there. It's not, you know, every case is different. As I said before, there's, you know, every single situation is different. And it's I think it, that side is focusing too much on an unborn fetus and not focusing on the life of a living human being and the living woman who's already in this world mm-hmm. and you know her well-being i think it's it's just too much focused on on an unborn fetus that isn't is just you know a bunch of cells in my opinion and that hasn't actually grown into a child mm-hmm. at that point so um i think it's yeah it's difficult there needs to be some sort of bridging of of the of the gap of the two mindsets to be honest but you know what was interesting as well speaking to her was that that we found it quite hypocritical that her father was heavily involved in the di- dictatorship years ago that actually disappeared a lot of children and sold them mm. into families. So it's kind of quite hypocritical that she defends her father and has these strong views about, you know, being pro-life, as she calls it, to, mm. to not um, allow women to have abortions. And yet her father was heavily involved in, you know, the dictatorship that, that disappeared and, and stole and sold babies. Yeah, my in my experience, the any any single issue that you look at in a country, um, especially one that you're not uh, isn't your native <laughs> native country, there's a lot in our own home countries. I I find I'm I'm more aware of the complexities, and I don't have to unpack them or try to learn them because they're part of what uh, growing up in that country was about right and i understand a lot of the nuances but as i you know living in in bolivia and reading news about south america and latin america any single issue is usually connected to all these other issues right and so abortion uh, has a lot to do with poverty and whether or not people feel they're able to make uh, choices whether that choice to carry a pregnancy to term 
is one, how does it impact that person's life? And, and what does that, that look like? So I don't know if you are, are there other, are there other aspects of the culture or the situation in Argentina that put that kind of pressure um, that you could tell us about on on people on women that feel this is an option even though it's illegal um, that it's an option they feel forced into um yeah I'm sure there are I think I mean I think particularly in in sort of like the sex industry um there I think there are a lot of abortions that go on um, and I think yes definitely poverty probably has a lot to do with it I think one of the biggest things, as, as you say, like obviously no one wants to have an abortion. And obviously the, you know, one of the biggest things is would be to reduce the amount of abortions that are needed or that are had. Or, um, But I think one of the biggest things that is that there needs to be more sex education as well. Um, mm. And that's something that the other side is very against on the whole from what we've, you know, from the people that we've interviewed and the people that we've spoken to. Particularly, you know, speaking to the crazy baby lady, she's 100% against sex education in schools. She doesn't think that it should happen. And that mm. surely is something that would prevent a lot of pregnancies and unwanted pregnancies. Mm. Um, but yeah, I think poverty definitely um, plays a big part in it. And I think uh, violence and, you know, with sexual violence and, you know, with the whole Ni Una Menos campaign, campaign against domestic violence, that probably will link to it as well. So yeah, I think there's a lot of a lot of other parts that play that you know a lot of other the other factors that play a part in it definitely. Yeah. So tell me a little bit more about this idea of, of sex education and the the crazy baby lady felt like they shouldn't be in the public schools, but it should be left to parents. Was that her her view? I think her, no. I think her view is literally that she does not believe that um, that people should be having sex before marriage, and that's it. And that's what she's taught. She has six children, and uh-huh. that's what she's taught her kids. And we actually spoke with one of her sons, and he was, you know, very much along going along with her views that you know mm-hmm. I'm not going to have sex before I get married, and and that sex, there's, there's nothing fun about sex. Sex should not be had, mm-hmm. and and that was the end of it. So I think it's it's maybe. A little bit silly, really, for her to and for you know some people to think that that's that it's not going to happen because mm-hmm. it's not as simple as that. And it was sex before marriage is going to happen, mm-hmm. whether you know she likes it or not, whether that side that side of the argument likes it or not. So as long as it is going to happen, surely a better way of dealing with it would be to try and prevent un- unwanted pregnancies by having sex education in schools. Um, because I don't think it's, you know, it's not logical really to believe that all kids are just going to accept what their parents say and, and not have sex before marriage. It's just not, it's not reality. Yeah. Well, and it may be, maybe one of the assumptions of this podcast is the idea that if, if there are things that are difficult for us to talk about, for the most part, whatever that, that topic or issue is, talking about it is better than not talking about, about it. Definitely. And so, 100%. And so, no matter what side you might be on ignoring it or trying to pretend that it it doesn't exist uh or that we shouldn't talk about it is is a part of the problem yeah 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 definitely definitely and i think you know that it is being well i mean the the abortion law and everything that's going on in argentina is something that is being highly talked about but i think it's yeah as you say it's it's sort of getting to the crux of why there is such a problem in the first place um because I do think things need to change. I think the law needs to change. Women do need to have the rights. But to, you know, to go even deeper down from that, there does need to be sex education. There needs to be other changes in the country mm-hmm. as well that go along with that. Um, yeah. I think women need to have the option and there needs to be not so many of these situations in the first place as well. So you mentioned earlier this idea that there there has to be a way to sort of bridge the gap to fi- figure out how the the two sides can come together and talk uh, to help change the mm-hmm. conversation in some way. Or do you have any thoughts about, at least with Argentina? I mean, it's it's a little different, probably in each country that are having these debates in the UK in the in the United States. Uh, it's a little bit different. So, at least from your perspective in Argentina, uh, or maybe it, it translates also to other other places. How, what from what you've observed, what what can we do to try and have a better conversation that that might lead to better results for everyone. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, with the whole campaign that happened in Ireland, which was the My Body, My Choice um, campaign, I think, for example, with that, there were a lot of videos and and 
media campaigns that showed, you know, the, some of the situations where women were not allowed to have abortions and and they needed one. It was like the woman was a, was going to die, an ectopic pregnancy, for example. There were mm-hmm. or the had been raped or there were all these situations where the woman was not allowed to have an abortion. And so I think, you know, bridging the gap slightly. And that is that I think in Ireland now the situation is that um, there are certain situations where abortion is allowed, but it's mm-hmm. still not, you know, as free and easy as it is in some other places. Mm-hmm. Um, and it is a difficult, it's, you know, it's not, as I said before, I think, I think from the pro-life anti-choice side, it needs to be made clear that, you know, people aren't just going for abortions willy nilly. It's not mm-hmm. just something, it's not an easy, simple choice that people are just like using it as a form of contraception. And maybe some people are, but it's not, it's not usual. Um, and it, it, it's not a choice and a decision that's taken lightly. So I think it's kind of, yeah, as you say, like talking about it more, people being more aware and being more informed about it. But I think it is a very hard thing to bridge the bridge, the gap in the divide, because from the people that we've spoken to on the the anti-choice side, they do seem to be very, very set in in their views. And a mm-hmm. lot of them are very, very misinformed. You know, some people we were speaking to were telling us that they thought people could have an abortion after nine months, <laughs> um, which obviously wasn't possible. Um, yeah. You know, one man was speaking to us telling us, oh, well, if I just have a daughter, then I can just kill her. And we were like, well, no, that's not an abortion. You know, we're not talking about killing born ch- children that are living, you know, not um, right. fetuses. It's not the same thing. And I think that's that's something that needs to, to change is that people are very misinformed. And mm-hmm. it's like, you know, there's the two um, views that are very, very extreme from one side to the other. Um, but right. it is something that I think will be very, very hard to change. Yeah. Well, there's certainly political parties and people in power that um, can use this as a tool to, you know, get get people motivated for voting for their their party. And that seems to be the way um, sometimes, yeah, issues like this get get used politically. That tends to ratchet up the rhetoric in a way that gets away from facts and gets away from mm-hmm. yeah. uh, a discourse that leads to some kind of solutions where everybody can maybe agree on on certain things. The other thing I noticed, too, is that there seems to be uh, a tendency, human tendency in many cases, to dehumanize, right? Um, so mm-hmm. from the pro-life or anti-choice side, they would call uh, pro-choice people murderers, right? And that's, yeah. a, that's yeah. pretty harsh, right? And uh, from the from the other side, it, I don't know. I don't know what uh, pro-lifers get called uh, bigots or uh, crazy baby ladies, for for example. I guess. Yeah. And maybe maybe I mean, sometimes honest, we get not... the the extreme example uh, instead of maybe somebody who would be more willing to to talk or or find a a common ground yeah it's funny because to be honest i've not heard you know as many comments from people on the pro-choice side calling you know the other people names apart from obviously the crazy baby lady um (laughs) but if you know if you google her and watch some videos um you'd probably agree that it's uh, it's quite an apt nickname for her Uh um but um but yeah i mean it's 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 kind of the same like we we were at the the march and the protests in the streets um the day of the senate vote and the pro choice campaigners were were calling the other side murderers as well because uh, equally they're saying that women are dying because of all these illegal abortions in horrific circumstances so i guess they're both calling each other murderers that seems to be the the, the sort of main thing that we heard being shouted out a lot of the time yeah, and it seems at that point, what what can you do? You know, you kind of need to stop and take some, somehow take some steps back to be able to have any kind of conversation. If if both sides are sort of calling each other murderers, it seems a little bit counterproductive. Yeah, and I think you know it does. It just does seem to be from the um, the anti choice side that there's just a lot of untrue facts being told. You know, when we when we mm-hmm. went, for example, to um, to this uh, this um, rogue abortion clinic, um, I was given a leaflet. You know, I, I went undercover as um, someone who was pregnant who wanted to get an abortion to find out what goes on there. And I was told a lot of untrue facts about, you know, 
if I have an abortion, I'll I'll suffer from depression and mental illness afterwards. Mm. I'll never be able to have a child again. There's risks of cancer. There's risks of this, that, and the other. There were there were all sorts of things on this leaflet that I knew to be untrue. Mm. Um, and you know, when we spoke to Mariana, um, nicknamed the crazy baby lady, she was telling us, you know, after after just a few days into pregnancy or a week or something that that the the fetus is fully far, formed. We were told this as well in the um the rogue abortion clinic and she's saying that you know the fetus can can feel all of its um all of its uh, legs and arms and extremities are, are all formed very very early on which is not true and you know mm-hmm. Andrew did challenge her in that way when she said the fetus can feel and it will feel pain and he said well well you know if I'm asleep and I move my arm I don't I don't feel it and I can't feel when I'm asleep so how do you know because that hasn't been proven and there's no facts around that and she was kind of stumped. There was sort of a long silence. So, you know, it's kind of like a lot of it is based on obviously just her being so passionate about her side of the argument, mm-hmm. but not actually having the medical and scientific facts to to prove any of that. Yeah. One one thing I, you know, trying to talk to people about things that are difficult or, or work through difficult conversations is trying to understand what's behind, you know, usually there's something behind why people may be the crazy baby lady. And since you've spent time with her, like, do you have any, any ideas like what for her, like maybe what's, what's uh, the need or the, the deeper thing maybe that's behind that for her, which might be also for some other anti-choice people that feels like a very uh, deep, deeper issue. That's not just the surface level of being, being anti-choice or being against abortion mm-hmm. but is a, a deeper belief that yeah, they have sure. maybe yeah. yeah and i think i think with her you know having got to know her i think per- perhaps a lot of it does stem from she's got six children and one of her sons was born very 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 prematurely um mm. and he is you know partially he has partial hearing and different problems and things like that so I do think that perhaps a lot of it comes from that because I can't remember how many weeks she said he was born at, but he was quite premature. And so I think perhaps that had quite a big effect on her that she's sort of thinking, well, if a baby could be aborted at that, that, you know, into that, that far into the pregnancy, um, Mm. then her son perhaps, you know, wouldn't be alive today kind of thing. Um, Mm -hmm. I don't think abortion should be allowed very very late in pregnancy myself that's my Mm -hmm. opinion um Mm. i think there has to be a cut off because yes there are lots of babies born prematurely and it Mm. is a fully formed baby at you know after a certain stage so i think that has to be some sort of middle ground but you know i don't you know it's not that argentina i think that what they're trying to the pro-choice side is fighting for at the moment is to have abortion up to 12 weeks Mm-hmm. Um, which is very, very early on. You know, in the mm-hmm. UK, it's actually legal up to 24 weeks in certain circumstances, which mm-hmm. is late, and that's very, very rare, obviously, that that would happen. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's due to problems, I assume, or, you know, um, complications where that needs to be done. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, for, for it to happen up until 12 weeks, I think that that is kind of like a bridging of, of the the divide, but obviously, mm-hmm. I don't think the anti-choice side would see it that way. But yeah, I think I think there probably are certain circumstances where something has happened in someone's life that makes them a bit more passionate about being anti-choice. And I think that does play a part for her. Um, yeah. Aside from that, I don't really know because she does have six children altogether. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think I think um, that her campaigning started even before that. So. I'm not too sure, though, when she sort of became as passionate about it as she is now, going around with the plastic fetuses and everything. Yeah. I'm sure that that probably plays a part in it, was having this premature son. Yeah. I, I also feel a sense that, that there's deeply held religious beliefs, clearly, that are are at the heart yeah, of sure. this issue for many people. And I think those people tend to feel like the other side doesn't understand and doesn't respect their their deeply held religious belief about yeah. sacred sacredness of life and that's one of those those areas where i i think there's a way to find common ground i'm not sure exactly how to do it mm-hmm. uh and we probably won't won't be able to do that on on this podcast uh today but that holding holding a a religious belief about the sacredness of life is not a 
bad thing. And there's a way that we could talk yeah. about it that yeah, for sure. that could honor that a little bit and, and find a way to, to meet people there to, to really show some more respect. I think at least in individual cases, for sure. I know on, on a larger scale with uh, like votes that are taking place, it's a much more political and very difficult, uh, much more uh, elevated tensions. But, mm-hmm. but in, in particular conversations, for sure, I think we could find ways to say that we really respect those deeply held religious beliefs that people have. Yeah, and, completely, yeah. Uh, I think that would help move the conversation forward with at least with individuals. Yeah, and I think that's something that, you know, perhaps from the people that we've spoken to in Argentina, um, that they perhaps just feel that, you know, the ones that are religious, that they're kind of losing losing their values or, you know, if things change, mm. that they're losing that those kind of traditions because um, it, it is a very Catholic country. Um, but there are also a lot right. of Catholics on the pro-choice side as well. Um, and I think mm-hmm. at the end of the day, you know, I don't think, and I'm from all the people we spoke to on the pro-choice side, I don't think they have anything against religion or Catholic beliefs at all. It just is more about, you know, having the freedom of choice and having choice and the rights to your own body. And I don't think, you know, I don't think it's it's on that side anyway, anything to do with sort of being anti-religion or, or anti-Catholic. It's more just about having that choice. Um, but I, I think that, yeah, from having the spoken to the people on the the anti-choice side it does seem to be that some of them perhaps you know um, it's a fearful of losing sort of the traditional beliefs and values of of their religion so it's yeah it's something yeah, yeah. that sort of needs to be needs to be kind of bridged mm-hmm. no i think that's helpful to talk about what is it that we're afraid of on on either side of the debate because those who are are wanting choice and and abortion to be safe and and legal are afraid for the safety of the women who are seeking abortions and have seen you know mm-hmm. what yeah. what happens when it's highly illegal yeah. others are afraid of losing their values and afraid of lots of changes that are happening in, yeah. in culture okay. throughout the world and those those fears are real and in some ways we're we're constantly acting out of those fears um and it makes it very difficult to to find some way to to meet those those fears but often we're not probably entirely aware that we're, that we're acting out of those fears mm-hmm. either yeah. yeah yeah definitely yeah yeah i think it's definitely something that needs to be addressed but yeah no that's i completely agree with you there that yeah i think there's fears on both sides for sure um mm-hmm. i just think yeah i think personally for me that it need, there needs to be some kind of you know option and choice for for safety and for that to be allowed and i think that mm-hmm. you know there needs to be more information um more facts about things there needs to be some way mm-hmm. to sort of bridge this gap yeah. um so that you know people have the choice in argentina and that it you know the other side understand why why those needs are there yeah you on your um indiegogo page where you're uh raising funds to finish up this film that you've made Mm -hmm. um you have this great map of the legal status of abortion worldwide Uh, and this is from 2018 Mm -hmm. this is from it says the center for reproductive rights do you have uh you know when we're talking about trying to find good facts, good information. I encounter this all the time when I'm trying to have conversations about topics where I disagree with somebody or their, their controversial issues is if I cite a source, sometimes somebody comes back and says, Oh, that's a, you know, just a anti choice site, or that's an anti um, pro life site or something like that and dismiss it. Do you have any, any good sources for information that you feel like are are neutral that that people might might be more willing to listen to or are just a good source of of information on the abortion issue um i mean as far as i'm aware i think that that uh, map is is accurate um sure. i think there's a lot of websites to do with um you know uh, family planning and there's the british pregnancy awareness association um all of those kind of things i they're not you know all pro-choice sites as such they're just gen- there's general mm-hmm. sites for example fpa that just deal with um with family planning um with all sorts with contraception mm-hmm. with just helping women in need um all sorts of things like that 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 they have 
you know, the uh, the tools and the facilities to to help people. Um, and that's not it's not just that they're you know pro choice only and strictly. It's just mm-hmm. um, general you know centres and websites for for women's well being rather than being like you know pro choice pro choice site. Yeah. Yeah, it's unfortunate um, because I know in the United States the same thing has happened with Planned Parenthood where an organization that does a lot of of different uh, services for women has been very politicized and turned into uh, that they're only about abortion. (laughs) And so they're, they're actually a very good source of information in the United States. But if you cited Planned Parenthood to anyone in the United States about uh, any facts about uh, abortion, it would, they would dismiss, you know, if they're pro-life, they would dismiss that. Right. Yeah. uh, I'm always trying to find, yeah. Ones that are neutral. Yeah. It's difficult neutral way it's yeah, difficult it yeah to yeah. find neutral neutral sites that show both sides yeah i mean our yeah. film we have tried to show both sides we obviously have challenged the other side mm-hmm. a little more um but we do sh- show both sides of, of the story it's not all based on the pro-choice side um you know we interviewed a lot yeah. of people in the street we spoke to mariana um and so yeah hopefully we have sort of showed both sides, but we are pro-choice mm-hmm. at the end of the day, so it does lean more towards more towards the, the, sure. the fact that we want there to be a change. Well, maybe one last question. As a filmmaker and somebody who go went into this project with a, a, a position, um, what was it like for you as you're following around and listening to people who are on the other side and trying to trying to keep that objectivity and not not uh, not entirely objective, but at least be open or uh, receptive to hearing from the other side. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I th- was that was that difficult for you or did you feel like, oh, I don't know if I'm going to if this is going to be hard to maintain my objectivity? Yeah. I mean, I was directing and filming and Andrew was the one sort of in front of the camera speaking to people. Um, but uh-huh. it, it was it was difficult and it was interesting to hear the anti-choice side. Um, as I mentioned, mm-hmm. it, it was it was just very, very frustrating to hear all the untrue facts and the misinformation that they were coming out with. Mm-hmm. Um, so that I found very yeah. frustrating listening to that side. But I did empathize with Mariana and some of her views. Um, some of her views mm-hmm. I just couldn't understand at all. And so we did challenge her and it was difficult. What I actually found a lot harder, though, was speaking to some of the women on the pro-choice side who had gone through horrific abortions in horrendous conditions. Yeah. And that's what yeah. I found actually the hardest, especially listening to mm-hmm. the Irish immigrant Um and how sort of upset and shaken she got and listening to what she went through was just awful. And that's probably what I found hardest. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, I think we can start wrapping up. I like to wrap up, um, my podcast with three questions each time. Mm -hmm. Um, something that we learned or something that we were reminded of during the conversation, uh, an action step, something that we can do, and then something we want to share, uh, that is a resource and I'll go first. Mm. Um, something, something that I learned as I was researching, uh, to getting ready to talk to you. I, it made me think, Oh, I don't know very much about abortion laws in Bolivia where I currently Mm -hmm. live. Um, and so I, I looked up, uh, information about that and it's, uh, fairly similar, I would say to Argentina that, it it's pretty limited what cases uh in what cases uh abortion is allowed and so i learned a lot about that history um getting ready for talking to you today yeah. but i also i also appreciate your willingness to engage in in this topic in a, a format on film to talk to people who don't agree with you and i i imagine that's that's hard in general, and I, I imagine there's a lot to learn from from your film, and so I'm excited yeah. uh, and hoping your uh, campaign to fund it will will be able to be successful. Mm-hmm. Something that we we can do an action step, I think, as you did talking to people on the other side, doing research, being willing to read uh, and get outside of our comfort zone. You know, we, I don't know that we came up with a really perfect, uh, source for learning about abortion from a very neutral perspective, but sometimes when we, uh, read more widely and listen to different sides, 
it can help us sort of filter out. <laughs> we It becomes more clear sometimes what's sort of extreme and, and doesn't really make sense and, mm-hmm. and where, where the exaggerations lie. Uh, so, you know, a lot of times I feel like we struggle because these topics are often very complex yeah. and, and sometimes can require a lot of, of research. But I think it's worth it if we're, especially if, if we're going to vote on it or we're going to make uh, sort of a stand about it or make statements about it to do some work. Um, we make a lot of time for a lot of other things that are probably yeah. not. I do too. I like to watch trash TV and yeah. <laughs> entertainment. Yeah. Sure. And I, certainly I can take some of that time and research an issue like abortion that I can be speak more intelligently about and, and try to understand um, facts rather than only my, my emotions or, or what I already agree with and what drives me. So um, yeah. we can all do a, a little bit of extra research. And then something that I will share is I'm going to share a link to your uh, Indiegogo fundraiser for the the film that you've made, and that will be in the show notes for the episode. I encourage people to go, and whether or not they agree, that there's yeah. uh, value in having this conversation out there and um, having people making uh, documentaries about different issues and, and highlighting these kinds of these kinds of fights. So. Lucy, for you, what what are three things, uh, something we learned, something we can do, and something uh, that you want to share? So, like, for sure, when I started doing this project, I looked into lots of uh, what was going on with abortion laws around the world as well. And one thing that I learned that I found really interesting um, whilst we were making this film was that the law in Argentina is technically the same as it is in the U.K., And that was something I found really interesting. So in writing, the law is actually um, technically the same. It's just the way it's perceived. So in the UK, it it is legal under certain circumstances. And I think you have to go through three doctors to be able to have an abortion here. And there has to be grounds that you can that you can have it um, have it done under. Um, But it's just seen in a very different way in, in Argentina. So it's it's just it's completely different. But technically, in writing, it's the same. So that was something that I learned that was that was really interesting to know. Wow. That's, um, that is it's highly really illegal in Argentina. Yeah, it's highly illegal. Whereas in the UK, there's a lot more flexibility on on the way that law is perceived. Um, so that was something that was really interesting. I also learned a lot about think... you know, the the anti choice side as well. Sorry, what were you going to say? Oh, do you think that that's uh, that's really fascinating to think that the the legal language is is very similar is it primarily the way that it's enforced or the way that the government enforces the law yeah i think uh, it's the way, it's it's the way that it's inter- interpreted yes it's the way that it's interpreted for sure um mm. it's just the way that, that that it's decided that it's that it's going to be put into place um so yeah uh, it, that was really interesting to hear for sure mm-hmm. and i also learned a lot about you know listening to the the anti-choice side um, mm-hmm. and learned that they are not very well informed <laughs> as a whole. I don't want to sort mm. of stereotype, but the people that we spoke to, that seemed to be the case. Um, yeah. To put into action, I think that, you know, if you if you do feel strongly about this, get out there and, and um, join in with the campaigns and help to make a difference, um, help to spread awareness about it. Um, and, and as you mentioned, to, to read up about it and, and be knowledgeable, knowledgeable about it. Um, I've learned a lot more since I've been doing this film, as you said, about different laws in different countries, even finding out recently that in New South Wales and Australia, it's still illegal as well. And they're trying to make a change there. There's lots of places around the world where mm-hmm. where there needs to be change. Um, mm-hmm. So I think, yeah, that's something that people can do is just to to be more informed about the situations and to be more more knowledgeable about them. Um, and then to share, of course, would be um, the, the the campaign for our crowdfunder, um, because we have entirely self-funded this film. Um, myself and Andrew, we worked with a very small crew of people to put this film together who all worked on it out of passion. Nobody's been paid and we're at the stage now where we just need a bit of extra money to to get the film finished. And that will go to things like music licensing, the final colour grade, the 
audio mixing and all of the things to make it into a professional piece that's that's can be broadcast so we just need extra money for that basically so if you if you're interested in the project and you feel passionately about it we would love that if you can share it can follow us um donate if you can every little helps every pound that goes into our fund will help us get this film finished and get it out there and it's such an important story that needs to be told and yeah. just to give you the links as well on the back of that um our instagram is at my body my body their choice um twitter is at my underscore body underscore film and you can find us on indiegogo um my body my choice uh, sorry my body my body their choice is the name of our film which is on the indiegogo website great and we'll, we'll include links to all of those in the show notes to the episode for anybody to find perfect well, Lucy de Cruz, I, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me. It's been very fascinating and, and interesting, and I appreciate uh, the work that you put into the the film, your insights into into this issue, and and just thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thank you so much. It's been you know it's been really hard work for us putting this together, but we really hope to get it finished, and it's something we're both really passionate about. So yeah, fingers crossed, we'll get it out there. Thanks very much for talking to me. Thanks for joining us on the podcast. I hope you found it helpful. If you enjoyed it, please help us spread the word by subscribing, sharing it with your friends, rating and reviewing it on Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Many thanks to Neil Curran and Infielder for the use of their music. You can find more of their music online at infielder.bandcamp.com. We would love to hear from you and get your feedback on the show or future topic ideas. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at WDTAT podcast or email us at WDTAT podcast at gmail.com. A final thought from Brené Brown. The willingness to show up changes us. It makes us a little braver each time. Until next time, keep showing up and keep being brave. What are you gonna do?